Hello there. So, I'm Bob, and I guess I'm described mostly as a space entrepreneur. Um, although my life has been vested mostly into building institutions, organizations, and companies uh, that are dedicated towards building a multi-planet spacefaring civilization. Uh, not unlike David and others, I was uh, a space cadet when I was a kid, for sure. I was the kid that ran home from school to watch Star Trek at 4 o'clock. Uh, and uh, spent a lot of my youth trying to figure out whether I was special or weird. And uh, I guess especially weird was maybe the answer. Or spatial. Or special, yes, yeah, spatially weird. Uh, I, uh, I was very, very fortunate to, early uh, in uh, my graduate years in college, university, to meet some wonderful people in the world who were members of the you know, influential guard of humanity talking about space and exploration. So my mentors were people like Arthur C. Clarke, um, uh, Carl Sagan, who I was fortunate to be uh, taught by and I became an assistant to at uh, Cornell. Um, a name that you may not be as familiar with, Gerard K. O'Neill, who's the modern day visionary of large scale space colonies, where you have tens of thousands of people living off planets in very Earth-like environments. So it was, I guess, the, the Apollo era that I was orphaned by, um, and many of us who are trying to build the new space era, the private space era now, really feel we were orphaned by a dream that was given to us as kids uh, that was unfulfilled when we were in university and college expecting to be involved and embraced by the space community. We found it just, uh, it wasn't uh, happening, you know, the, the, the colonies on the moon, the big wheels in space, and the civilizations heading towards Mars just weren't happening. So I founded, uh, as a student, an organization called Students for the Exploration and Development of Space uh, with a gentleman named Peter de Mendes, uh, a name you may recognize from XPRIZE Foundation and, and other activities. Uh, we went on to found an organization trying to unite all of the youth of the world into a symbolic group called the Space Generation, which is the idea that all of us born since the beginning of the space age are members of this generation that is forever severed from those that came before, and as important as perhaps the first amphibians that left the oceans and wandered under land, we, the generation of space, are now leaving the Earth and venturing out into the oceans of space. Later, uh, the, as students still, we founded the International Space University, which is now celebrating its 25th year, exclamation mark. Uh, and we have a beautiful campus in Strasbourg, France. We have three MBA pro three master's programs, including an MBA, and thousands of graduates worldwide are, that are becoming part of what we call a, the space mafia. And more recently, I've uh, co-founded a university again with Peter, uh, this time with Ray Kurzweil, called the Singularity University, based here in, uh, in, uh, at the NASA Ames Research Park, which you may be familiar with. So two universities, a uh, number of organizations. Uh, I've been involved in two space missions, uh, a Mars mission, uh, the last uh, landed mission on Mars called Phoenix. I was involved in that, and as well as an orbital mission called Access 11, both with Lockheed. And uh, I'm currently the CEO of a company called Moon Express, we're based here in Silicon Valley. We're competing for the $30 million Google Lunar X Prize to become the first private company to put a robot on the moon and start the move of humanity to our next planetary neighbor. And that's what I'm focused on mostly today and representing most of the entrepreneurial efforts out there. So that's, uh, that's a synopsis of, of Bob. I have great respect for Neil's views, and I think he's one of the best spokespersons for space out there. Um, you know, Neil arguing that we have to not minimize or um, marginalize the space budget of the world, and in particular NASA, is a good argument. Um, I don't think NASA's budget should be decreased, uh, but also I don't think NASA should be the only one executing the vision of space. And uh, we're in the economic times now where partnerships with the private sector as we become from, you know, we move from a uh, exploration species to a settlement species of space, we need to see this transition happening. And the entrepreneurial investment in finding the uh, business models that allow the private sector to become the 
providers of the technologies and the missions and let NASA do the wonderful inspirational things it did that brought us into, many of us into the space sector in the first place, allow it to do those amazing things that it's so good at doing, but get it out of the jobs business and the, and the, and the transportation business and let it do the exploration business, the stuff that's really hard. It's a common misconception, the magnitude of the NASA budget compared to every other agency or other government spending. And there's this large disparity between the the perspective of how large the budget is because it's such a visible and exciting set of accomplishments that people have this disjointed idea. If you ask, I'm sure not this audience because you're probably more familiar with space activities because you're here, but if you ask the general person on the street how much of the government dollar, what percentage goes to space activities to fund all of Apollo, all of Space Shuttle, all the amazing outer world experiences, all of the Mars programs, all of Hubble, all of the things that you know, are part of our human culture. How much of every dollar do you think is spent? And the average answer is around, well, 10%, maybe, you know, maybe even 20%. Does anybody really know what the answer is? We wish. Yeah, we <laughs> wish. Anybody, anybody think it's less than five cents on the dollar? 3%? Half a penny. Half a percent. Half a penny. Now, I think, you know, based on the, what we do accomplish, what NASA does accomplish, even if there's a lot of controversy over where it should be spent, if you look at the aggregate of what the activity of NASA has done, not just for the United States, but for all of human culture, I think it's a great investment and I think it should be continued. So we've been, we've been humans for a long time, and passion and, and vision and commitment has been part of our nature for a long time. Um, and it absolutely infects every one of us is the reason why everyone I have met who's truly committed to the space industry starts with the passion and the commitment and the vision, the excitement. But here's what's different today. What's different today is never before in history has so much capital and so much technology been available to a few to be able to enact things that change the world for billions of people. We're living in an age today where the means of affecting billions is dematerializing into our hands. And instant communications across the planet, which is mimic, biomimicking the, the system we have in our bodies that, that, uh, that make up what we call human beings. You know, we're coming a planetary species communicating each other. So we as humans are now able to do things with small groups of people that only governments, nation states used to be able to do a few decades ago. And the, the average person on the planet today who has one of these has more information available at the fingertips than the President of the United States did just 15 years ago. So it's an enormously different age that we live in and the ability for individuals to become themselves heroes of humanity and do things that have worldwide impact has never been before so prevalent. You know, one of the things we study at Singularity University is, you know, the advancing exponential growth of technology enabling individuals to be able to take on grand challenges of humanity and make the world a better place also has a dark side, which is the same type of technologies can be used by those who wish to harm a large number of people. And, and where, where, do you, where do you draw the line or how can you, where should you or where should you not regulate that type of activity? Um, the, uh, the, uh, although this, the, the, theme, the theme that you talked about um, of there being a, 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 a logical division between that which nation states can and should do and that which entrepreneurial activities can and should do, um, I agree thematically, but I don't think the line was far enough out. I think the economic sphere of Earth will move outward to the moon and to Mars based on the driven visions of entrepreneurial people rather than governments before the governments get there. So asteroids and Mars in particular, I think the private sector is going to be there before the governments are. So there are lots of lessons to be learned from history and we, we, we don't learn from, you know, we don't learn those lessons at our peril. However, there's a different substrate acting right now uh, yes, we've been humans for a long time, but what we haven't had for a long time is technology. 
So what's going to happen is the future that we consider science fiction is going to hit us so fast that it's going to, it's going to be perceived to happen all at once. We have, our minds are wired to think linearly. You know, this is how we evolved. We knew that if the tiger is coming from that direction and the tree is that far, we can calculate very well what it, how many 30 steps it takes to get up that tree. But what we're not good at, what the brain is not good at, is thinking exponentially. And every technology and our civilization is moving forward based on an exponential substrate that's going to enable us to not only utilize machinery and computers to our advantage much more quickly, but become symbiotic with those machines that we create. So the ultimate future that's going to happen very quickly, uh, when we think about, you know, how do we adapt Mars to humans, I don't think that's the question at all. The question is going to be, how do we adapt humans to Mars? So the homo spatians that will evolve out of our combined human-machine interfaces of the future are going to happen very quickly. And the science fiction that we think of is actually here today. It's in the labs, and it's going to happen very, very quickly. So to put the, the Netscape moment you mentioned near the beginning of the program in a historical perspective, I think we're, we're about to have that. So without, you know, without uh, cutting hairs too thinly on months or years, uh, there's, going to be, there's going to be a watershed moment when SpaceX uh, issues its IPO, its initial public offering, which is expected kind of next year. So VCs, you know, agreeing that VCs aren't the only source of money, for sure, nor necessarily are they the most desirable source of money for a startup. However, um, once, once the established markets can see a company build itself to the point that SpaceX has, you know, about a billion dollar valuation, I think it is right now, um, with a very visionary person who's got a lot of his own chips on the table, but together with other money, we know that Founders Fund joined in with Elon afterwards in the order of about $20 million, and then there was an institutional events, uh, ed event from Draper Fershit Jurvetson here in town, you know, around $80 million. So there are these examples, and now it's about to go for an IPO next year. That will make it easier for the rest of us coming, coming behind. Moon Express's example is we are on a venture that is going to cost on the order of $70 million to complete our first mission to the moon. That's a lot of dough. Um, we have been following a Silicon Valley model, which is very culturally systemic within the area of the valuation climb through serious milestone accomplishments and different series of investments. Uh, it's not a question of getting, hoping you'll have a Paul Allen, which is the person who invested in Burt Rattan's Spaceship One that won the X Prize. There are those people out there. Um, we have a billionaire involved in the founding of our company, Naveen Jain. And, but the question is, the right amount of money at the right time to build the valuation of the company. And we've been developing our funds based through Series A's and we're going into a Series B. There's multiple millions of dollars uh, on the table, but we will have to raise on the order of you know, 20 or $30 million in total to do this mission. And that's in the realm that's usually beyond the angels and we have to get into more of the VCs. And I think we're at the, at the stage now where that type of institutional money will become more readily available for more enterprises.